Welcome back to Curious Archive. This video is the finale of my two-part series of the biology of the video game Subnautica Below Zero. Deeper within this alien ocean, astonishing ecosystems, shocking mysteries, and chilling terrors still await discovery. And much like how the strangest life in Earth's oceans dwells in the abyss, the depths of Sector Zero open a whole new world of surprises. I've also found it an even more frightening place to do fieldwork. And with the mysterious signal calling out from the deep at the end of the last video, who knows what final secrets Planet 4546b is hiding. So, join me on the last section of our documentary-style voyage as we conclude this expedition into the unknown. The mysterious transmission is emanating from the murky waters of a region known as the Deep Twisty Bridges. Diving into these alien depths, the only light comes from the bioluminescent coral bridges that spiral throughout this cavernous abyss. The dimness of the deep has transformed all life that swims in the gloom. Like pale ghosts, the skeletal spinefish haunt these depths. A subspecies of the hoopfish, the spinefish have become nearly translucent and possess rib-like markings that give them a deathly appearance. The phenomenon of certain deep-sea fish becoming transparent is present in Earth's oceans as well. Notably in the barrel eye fish, an animal that possesses a head made of translucent tissue to allow it to look upwards and spot its preferred prey right through the top of its head. Truthfully, the barrel eye fish is an animal that would seem right at home in the oceans of planet 4546b. But the spinefish isn't a carnivore, so despite its haunting appearance, it's no real danger. But there are genuine dangers here. A huge predator swims, torpedo-like, among the bridges. With unexpected speed, it rushes in and attempts to swallow me whole, a fate I'm barely able to avoid by prying its jaws open. The predator continues to give chase, but I escape by swimming into a crevice it can't reach. That terror of the abyss was a squid shark, a highly aggressive fauna species that is the apex predator of this region. Analysis suggests its terrifying bursts of speed come from two vents on either side of its body, which provide jet propulsion. Through this adaptation, the squid shark, like its name suggests, combines the most formidable aspects of deep-sea squids and macro-predator shark species. The result is a deadly amalgamation I'll have to keep a wide distance from if I ever want to find the source of the transmission. Staying close to the ocean floor, a curious, waving plant catches my eye. Swimming in for a closer look, the lifeform lashes out with a long tendril and pulls me towards a mouth-like opening. After a few frantic punches, the creature releases its tentacle and I swim out of range. That was a spiky trap, which isn't actually a plant at all, but a highly unusual form of animal. This carnivorous lifeform blends into the terrain, camouflaging itself among vegetation and catching fish and unwary explorers with its adhesive tendrils when they swim too close. And despite its lack of mobility, this strategy seems to be highly effective. In the deep twisty bridges, one must always stay alert. Elsewhere on the sea floor, I discover a strange glowing device near the signal source. This ruined fragment matches the strange structures present in the tropics, which belong to a group of alien architects. I'd assumed all the architects had perished, but with the signal beckoning me onwards, I wonder if I was mistaken. At last, I reach a mysterious undersea facility. As I navigate through the halls, an unknown voice urges me to hurry. Entering a central chamber, I find both the signal and the voice have been coming from this cube-shaped computer. The voice turns out to be that of an architect, who, thousands of years before, had stored his consciousness within the computer. Speaking through the cube, the architect explains he was a scientist like me, and is now likely the last of his kind. Wanting to help a fellow researcher, I offer to transfer the lonely consciousness to my field computer and take him with me on my expedition. The architect accepts and warns me to brace for transfer. A little too late, I realize something might have been lost in translation. Awakening with a mild headache, I can hear the architect's voice quite clearly. 
and learned this is because he downloaded himself directly into my brain. It was an honest mistake, as architects don't recognize a boundary between technology and the body. While this is an intriguing revelation about architect biology, it means I now have an unanticipated mental roommate. Returning to the shallows, we formulate a plan. We'll use our combined knowledge to continue to chart the biology of life in Sector Zero. But along the way, we'll gather the material needed to fabricate a body that my new friend can transfer into. He tells me his designation is AL-AN, so I'll call him Alan. Picking up where Alan's research left off, we venture to the sprawling expanse of the West Arctic. Here, great icebergs float above a seemingly bottomless region of the sea, creating a profound sense of scale. And among these giant icebergs swim undiscovered oddities. Gliding through the blue is an animal that is difficult to unravel. With two sets of wing-like fins, it's not clear what sort of life form we're observing at a glance. But this life form is, in fact, an arctic ray, the first of many ray species in Sector Zero. While its body plan has clearly diverged from Earth rays by having four wing structures instead of two, the arctic ray is a highly agile life form. And it has to be, if it wants to avoid the top predator of the West Arctic. This is a Pinacarid, an intelligent and social predator that spends half its time on ice floats above the water. Pinacarids have converged on an ecological niche similar in many respects to Earth seals, and are remarkably friendly towards humans, even showing acute curiosity when lured in with a tasty piece of fish. Alan's analysis suggests their 14 flippers make them acrobatic hunters underwater. This unusually high number of flippers resembles the anatomy of anomalocarids, a group from Earth's Cambrian period who similarly possessed multiple fins for locomotion. Descending deeper into the West Arctic waters, what appears to be a legion of pulsating eyes stare back at us. This is, in fact, a colony of eye jellies. Gelatinous life forms that harbor an enormous hemispheric eye on the tops of their bodies. Despite their somewhat alarming appearance, these creatures live remarkably passive lives, drifting slowly on the currents in vast colonies, paying little mind to other species. Alan notes that they are capable of releasing a small electric shock if we swim too close, however, so we'll give the group a wide berth. Upon one of the West Arctic icebergs, we notice an entrance to a small cave. Venturing inside, the reflected ice caught in the afternoon sun resembles the brilliance of the night sky. And within this ethereal cave, a strange egg appears stranded on a cave wall. It's not a species Alan recognizes, and it seems about ready to hatch. Bringing the egg to the warmth of the shallows, after some time, this creature emerges. The unusual hatchling turns out to be a trivalve, and much like the cuttlefish of the tropics, it's a remarkably friendly and intelligent creature that is quite a fan of treats. A scan suggests the body of this naturally inquisitive life form is made of a flexible exoskeleton, and somewhat resembles the shell of an earth nautilus in its shape. It's tempting to relax in the shallows with the trivalve for longer, but Alan reminds me we still have other areas to chart. And the next leg of the journey will be perilous indeed. Luckily, I have a new classification of submersible to aid in the voyage. This is a sea truck, an underwater vehicle that will allow us to go lower into the crushing depths of Sector Zero than ever before. At the helm of the sea truck, we venture into the vast biome of the Thermal Zone. The edge of this region, an area known as the Thermal Spires, is marked by a forest of hydrothermal vents. These chimney-shaped structures are formed from dissolved minerals pushed up from the planet's crust, and are home to all kinds of remarkable life. Gliding between the vents is a brightly colored featherfish. Defined by their unusual crescent-shaped fin structure, featherfish are one of the more graceful herbivores in Sector Zero. A highly successful species, in some regions they gather in schools numbering in the thousands. 
We are admiring one such school when an intimidating creature paddles by. This vicious looking armored predator is a cryptosuchus and is covered in sharp spines. Snapping wildly, it closes in and then retreats just as quickly. As it turns out, the contrarian cryptosuchus is one species where its bark is truly worse than its bite. While it appears fearsome, a scan suggests its menacing shell is adapted to aid in heat absorption among the thermal vents. And so, this false tyrant paddles away, to try and scare off something a bit smaller. Far deeper into the thermal zone, the dark blue of a biome known as the Tree Spires beckons. These waters are lit by the bioluminescent flora that grow on the sides of tree-like hydrothermal vents. In this distinctive region, the equally distinctive discus fish undulates along. Its flat, semi-transparent body is highly unusual, and it seems to contain strange green organs. A study of the discus fish reveals this green color comes from symbiotic algae-like organisms, living within specialized body cavities that provide the discus fish with food. Strange as this might sound, emerald sea slugs of Earth also photosynthesize using algae that grows within their bodies. Since there isn't much sunlight here in the depths for plant growth, it's likely the discus fish spends part of its life cycle in a brighter region of Sector Zero. Elsewhere in the thermal zone, we can spot a teardrop-shaped arrow ray. This ray species has an elongated body and a rather triangular head, which it can tilt to perform unpredictable maneuvers. At the ends of the arrow ray's fins grow sharp, talon-like tips that deter attackers who manage to catch up, meaning the arrow ray certainly isn't defenseless. A huge life form passes in front of our submarine. Without warning, it shrieks and latches onto the windshield with its front mandibles. Gunning the engine, I'm barely able to twist out of the deadly grip. That Leviathan-class organism was a chelicerate, a brute that grows over 130 feet, or 30 meters in length. Its body is covered in a thick, segmented exoskeleton that grows in overlapping plates, which may offer protection from the atmospheric pressure. Since the chelicerate are so aggressive and potentially deadly, they're a challenging species to study up close. Fascinating as they are, we both hope we don't encounter any more of them. At the very bottom of the sea floor, an indescribably massive life form is waiting. This is a vent garden, a stationary leviathan that anchors itself above hydrothermal vents and consumes 100% of the nutrients they release. At over 360 feet, or 110 meters, the Vent Garden is, by far, the largest leviathan of Sector Zero. The only things in Earth's oceans that resemble Vent Gardens are certain types of siphonophores, soft-bodied entities which, like the Vent Gardens, are also technically colonies of smaller organisms working in tandem. But what's most incredible about the Vent Garden is the internal ecosystem of plants it supports within its hollow, bell-shaped center. And remarkably, a scan indicates it would be safe to enter this environment ourselves. Exiting the submarine, we tentatively swim up towards the light, and at last emerge within the microcosm of the Vent Garden. This mini-ecosystem supports aquatic flora on branching platforms that in turn help absorb some of the heavy metals emitted by the vents below. Exploring the hidden biosphere of a vent garden is a downright magical experience. But the unknown still beckons. Pushing further into the abyss than ever before, we've reached the edge of the habitable region for most fauna. Surrounded by total darkness, Alan is starting to get worried that we've strayed too far. And he seems to be right. A huge chelicerate emerges from the blackness, almost twice the size as the one from the tree spires. This pale mutation is called a void chelicerate, and it's not alone. We've stumbled into a pack. Time to head back as fast as we possibly can. I don't think either of us plan on revisiting this area anytime soon. Returning to the safety of the research base, I have, with Alan's help, given our station a bit of an upgrade. As it turns out, having an alien scientist downloaded into your brain can be quite useful. 
And while Alan still doesn't understand the purpose of basic things like music or why I start every morning with coffee, together we've successfully mapped much of Sector Zero. Yet a deep scan tells us there's a strange signature coming from a large ice cave we've yet to visit. The cave is far to the inland of Sector Zero. At last, we enter the cavern and discover an enormous frozen creature encased in a cave wall. This Leviathan-class organism has been entombed here for thousands of years, as Alan remembers encountering their kind when he was a researcher here long ago. Since this species is, hopefully, now extinct, the only way to study it is to drill into the ice. Taking a DNA sample from the creature's foot, I'm able to determine the life form was quadrupedal, and spent at least a portion of its time on land, something unusual for planet 4546b. Perhaps this frozen leviathan suggests an era in the distant past where land was more plentiful and great titans like this one roamed across it. In any case, I'm certainly glad this particular specimen is now long dead. I think. At long last, we now have all the necessary materials needed to fabricate Alan's new body. The only problem is that the one architect facility that can create such a compatible vessel is located in a region known as the Crystal Caves. These caverns are the deepest biome of them all, and the last frontier of planet 4546b. And since the refractive crystals mean any scans of the region come back fragmented, there's no telling what else is down there. Navigating the Purple Chasm, this environment possesses a strange beauty, and equally strange life forms can be found in these depths. The Triops is a tiny organism that spends much of its time hiding from predators in the surrounding terrain. The Triops stand out biologically, however, thanks to their distinctive three-eyed ocular system. In nature, a life form evolving three distinct eyes isn't particularly common, but it's not altogether unheard of. Artemia is a genus of aquatic crustaceans that possess two eyes mounted on flexible stalks and a third stationary eye situated in the center of their head. So the diminutive Triops is in good company. Further into the planet's crust, we've arrived at the Fabricator Caves, a secondary layer of the Crystal Caves where a high concentration of the element beryllium led to the formation of striking red crystals. To brave this extreme geochemical environment, I've donned the Prawn Suit, a deep-sea mechanical walker that kept me safe on the last stages of my journey in the tropics. Stomping along the ocean floor, I spot a small crustacean nearby. Given its diminutive stature, I'm not particularly worried, until it launches itself at my prawn suit. This is a rock puncher, a pint-sized predator which is a heavy hitter nonetheless. Its hardened claws can thrust forward at close to the speed of sound to break rock and bone alike. In many respects, the rock puncher is similar to the precocious mantis shrimp. These creatures possess spring-loaded biological hammer clubs that can strike prey faster than the speed of a bullet, giving the mantis shrimp the ability to truly punch above its weight class. And the rock puncher is no different. Time to de-escalate the situation by moving elsewhere. We're now very close to the fabrication facility when a thunderous roar shakes the cavern. A huge leviathan grips my prawn suit and pulls me towards a glowing gullet. After smacking it with my prawn suit's arms, the nightmare serpent temporarily drops me. Backing into a narrow gap, it seems the leviathan cannot follow. We're safe. For now. That was a shadow leviathan, which at almost 200 feet, or 60 meters, is the single most dangerous predator of Sector Zero. Its elongated body gives this monster the appearance of a giant eel. Analysis suggests its bioluminescent digestive tract glows due to light-seeking phytoplankton that draw in unwary fish, and its mouth also secretes a highly acidic compound. We're lucky we were able to escape such a terrifying life form unscathed. Or have we? Looking up, I notice my prawn suit is leaking from its fight with the Shadow Leviathan. 
Our only hope now is to reach the fabrication facility before the shadow finds me again. But with the familiar green glow of architect technology up ahead, at last we've reached the ultimate destination. Heading inside, I find a facility quite like the one I first discovered Alan within. Putting in the materials we've gathered, the facility begins the process of fabrication. Activating the final sequence, Alan and I watch as the vessel is constructed. This new body is composed of the DNA of 27 different species, and various inorganic materials as well, so it should be quite the upgrade. At last, Alan's body is complete. After so much effort, it's almost surreal to reach this point. I think about telling my friend he looks a bit like a glowing purple centaur, but decide that would probably just confuse him. With Alan now out of my mind and settled into his new vessel, he doesn't need my assistance to continue his research. We both return to the surface, and Alan informs me he'll be going back to his home planet via warp gate to see if there are any other architects still living. It is a somewhat bittersweet feeling as I realize this is goodbye. Working with another researcher, in particular an alien one, has been a special privilege. Alone on planet 4546b once more, I consider all I've seen on this wondrous planet. From nerve-wracking dangers to unexpected allies, it's been a remarkable journey. But now, at last, the time has come for me to depart as well. For who knows what else is waiting among the stars. If you enjoy discovering the creatures of Subnautica below zero, please follow and support creature designer Alex Reese using the links below. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.